Good morning. It's uh, lovely to be here. And uh, Andre, thank you for inviting me to share with you some thoughts, um, not only on financial planning per se, but actually more about the environment that we need to do our planning in. Um, uh, I grew up in Bloemfontein, um, hence my accent. Um, and that uh, was where I spent most of my formative years. Um, my father was a minister of the Gereformeerde Kerk. For you guys, that's Afrikaans, it's a reformed church. It is um, uh, a world that I really enjoyed. And I looked at my father and I thought, yeah, I, I think I want to become what he is. And um, so that uh, pushed me into theological studies. Um, I've studied for 10 years full time the uh, theology. I really enjoyed that. Um, then I got to know myself better and I realized that I'm not my dad, um, even though I enjoyed the studies, really I did. Um, so um, at that stage I was married with two small, small children, Skitter and Vikas, who's my business partners at the moment. Uh, in our practice, uh, we have got an ind independent financial practice that uh, are, we actually um, run from Stellenbosch. But you know how it is nowadays, uh, you work from wherever you are. So it's, it's um, where our official address are, but uh, yeah, I am. Um, so I married my um, university girlfriend, Myrtle. Uh, we've been married for 25 years this year. Happily married. She's a wonderful, vibrant, friendly, bubbly personality. It's wonderful to share life with her. Um, and um, it's an, an incredible uh, privilege to actually be um, able to work with one's sons. Uh, Skitter is married. Uh, he's 25. Um, Vikas is a very analytical young man, very much focused in the investment area. He's busy with his postgraduate studies as well. And um, um, he's busy with the postgraduate studies that I finished at Kofsis in financial planning law after I finished my theolo theology, theology studies. So this is a bit of background so that you maybe can just understand that I've, um, I've, I've really kind of traveled in, in my mind uh, a lot. Um, I've spent a lot of time with, with people over the years. I, I really love people. Um, I'm intrigued by each individual, their own story, uh, their own challenges. Um, and um, uh, I actually became aware how important it is through what lens do you look at reality? What's the tint of your glass when you put on your glasses in the morning and you look at reality? Someone will have a different look than what the other one will have. I want to share, this is the first small, small part of, of what I want to share with you, is actually what I think one as a Christian businessmen, businesswomen should bolt into their vision. If it's not a natural tint that your glass have, maybe think of it, maybe making it part of your tint. It helps you. So when, when God introduces himself in a revelation, uh, chapter one, he, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. And then he uses the words, the Almighty. Remember, it's God who speaks about himself. It's not someone else who's giving God a title. He says of himself, the Almighty. Now, the, 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 the word there is pancrucatos. You know what an autocrat is? Now, a pantocrat is above all the autocrats. And that is what God tells about himself. All right, so all power all authority, all might flows into him and flows out of him. So he is in total, total command. Right. That's a critical tint that I think one should have in one's glass if you look at reality. Right. That's how God introduces himself. Then in Ephesians 1, I'm going to read it to you. The Pantocrat. God informs us what his ultimate purpose is with creation. The whole Ephesians 1 actually speaks about that. But a very specific verse in there states the following. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ 
Now, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That is God's ultimate purpose. That's His project. That is what's transpiring of which we live day by day and we put on our glasses every day and we look at reality while we planning surviving, striving, hoping, dreaming, scheming. All right, this is what God's busy with. He's uniting everything under Christ. How does that happen? Back to Revelation again. In Revelation, the Lord speaks to John about a scroll, a scroll that's got seals on it and then there's this cry in heaven who's worthy to open this scroll the scroll is the unfolding of history the the fulfillment the fullness of time that needs to happen it's, think of a water bottle that's got a capacity and it's filling until you've got this brimming and then it overflows that's time that's the fullness of time and God's in, he created time to bring something about, and that is to get all powers, everything under Christ. And then this outcry, who's worthy to break the seals so that the history can kind of roll open and, and fill, this, fill this water bottle of time. And they cry out, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? And then I saw a lamb that as, looking as it has been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures, and it flows from that, again, what's the tint of your glass? The lamb is worthy to break the seals. And then Jesus starts to break the seals. All right, and I watched the lamb open the first of the seven seals, and this is where the four horses of the apocalypse, the first four seals, runs out now in the tint of your glass it's critical to understand who's sending out the horses of the apocalypse it's jesus jesus is in command remember pancrocatos god is in command even of the horses of the apocalypse bringing it back to financial planning this is the reality where we survive strive hope and dream and plan right so the horses of the, uh, when the lamb opened the, um, the first seal, the seal, it breaks it open, and there was before me a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Who sent out the horse? Jesus, Jesus in command. The Pancrocatos is in command. Putin, Ukraine, it's, 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 it's part of the scroll that's rolling open. It's part of seals, God is in command. We read through the Old Testament, I'm actually currently in Je Josiah. Nebuchadnezzar, all those guys, they were, they were used by God. They were, they, were, they were in his hand. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Economical inequality, severe economic inequality. Um, some countries you'll not find it that much, others you will. But it's, 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 remember in time, God is not in time. He's out of time, but he created time. So you'll, you'll, you'll see some countries suffering more of this and some other not that much, but it's actually the black horse. All right, you can't plan it and you can you can you 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 can't undo 
what God's done. Gives one a perspective, right? Gives you a perspective. It's tinting your glass. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, the Lamb, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by wild beasts of the earth. Unnatural deaths. It happens. It's part of it. All right. Within that reality, we need to plan. All right. So, I think now you know from a Christian perspective, from a biblical perspective, how I look at reality. And that is the world that I step in when I step into Andre and Yulindi's lives and other clients' lives and, and new people I get to meet. Um, uh, this, this really, really helps us not to panic. Not to panic. We feel the waves. We feel it crashing down. We feel we swept along. And, and uh, the whole of Revelation is full of it. You won't be um, absolved from this. You, you're part of this. You, you're in this free, free flow of, of, of time as, as God just rolls over, over everything, um, um, open history and time. All right. So what is financial planning then? Financial planning is the process where you sit and think, what is the critical realities of this folding open of history in my life? What can happen to me or to my loved ones that I actually can plan for? Right. There's a lot that you, you can't plan for. It's out of your control. You just need to take note of that. And as a Christian child of God, it, the, it's not a panicky thing, right? It's a strategic thing, knowing that God's busy. In Philippians, um, my dad made a wonderful sermon. It's actually stuck. I was at school still, and I, I just remember it. The point he made was that Christians can adapt because it's God who changes the times. We are not stuck. We are not rigid type of people. We are incredibly fluent in, in, in adapting. All right. And that is where financial planning again comes in. A good financial plan needs to be flexible. All right. Because God moves the times and we need to adapt for that. So in your life, the critical questions, and I'm going to quickly just bob them out so that, in, um, that there's some value for you from a financial planning point of view as well, which you can ask your financial planner. Firstly, how do I choose my financial planner? A financial planner, you can actually study it. It's a postgrad study in financial planning law. It's where the law and the financial world actually cuts. So I'm not an auditor, but I'm confident in tax. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm confident in law. So where those two worlds actually coincide, that is where a financial planner sits. Financial planning products is actually legislation wrapped. All right. Um, in, in packages and presented. So your, your financial planner needs to understand legislation much more than products. Product is a plaster. If your doctor only knows uh, which one is the best plaster to use elastic plaster or something else, um, that's, uh, that's not making him a good doctor. He needs to be able to look deeper. All right, so that's firstly, ensure that your financial planner understands legislation. The Financial Planning Institute is our professional body. Um, it's an international body. And um, uh, if you studied postgraduate financial planning, you apply to become a member. All right, so you can actually just ask him. You'll see at the end of his name, CFP, Certified Financial Planner. That's a, the registered trademark. So that's a quality of your doctor. All right, just double check that he knows what he says he knows. Um, then. It's all about the type of questions that a financial planner asks. It's diagnostic, it's analytical, it's surgical. Um, it's, it's, it's all about making sure that the following is actually covered. How are you married? In community, out of community, with or without a crew? It really, really does matter. All right. Um, if you're married in community and one of the partners dies, 
it's um, you don't own half of everything each partner now owns everything of everything that's why um, uh, bank accounts get frozen if one partner dies because everyone owns everything the accrual system um, the accrual um, comes into effect when there's divorce or death and um, then it, it all depends on what your will says if you're married with the accrual system and not everything is going to the wife but some parts of it is going to trust and children and parents and so on you can't bequeath what is not yours then there's planning you can see so now it's the wills act that comes into play all right um so this that's it's critical questions how are you married what does your will say very important um then it flows into the following scenarios i'm going to play a scenario just so that you and your minds can just tick it and discuss it with your financial planner if it hasn't been been discussed you're in a vehicle accident all right and there's uh is, uh, does your insurer know that you've been in an accident? Who knows that you've been in an accident? Is that something that you're willing to pay for to minimize that risk? It, it, it starts even with those questions. How will someone know that I've been in an accident? All right? Insurance actually takes care of that. Different companies, all right? Um, secondly, when the ambulance stops, will it know uh, to take me to the correct hospital? If you, for instance, on the essential delta core with discovery it is delta or it is a classic smart plan that's smart hospitals uh, or if the key care that's other type of hospitals or are you on a on a, on a coastal core but you've been in an accident in Elspray it, it 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 all matters and that's critical scenarios in this remember my tinting all right I, I don't want to bring in panic at all it's all about tinting it's all about planning for scenarios asking the right questions all right, so your financial planner needs to ask questions, a lot of them. All right, what if that, what if that, all right. So then it flows into the short-term insurance space. Now that my vehicle's been in an accident, it, it, it actually speaks to cash flow, your short-term cash flow. Tell me, if your vehicle been in an accident, how will that be repaired? Or if you drive into a Rolls Royce and it's your fault, you're liable for that damage as well. Um, What's your strategy if that happens? Now, my short-term insurance policy must take care of that. All right, fine. How are you then insured? It's questions again. All right. So you can imagine from all the questions that I'm just throwing at you how important it is for a financial planner to have a very, very efficient back office. You have to have a host of real quality people um, actually um, employed so that you, not, uh, you, you can actually ask the questions and plan and they and you just pass out and um, they they need to to sort the, the administrative side out critical question as well to to ask your financial planner are you well resourced in terms of personnel um all right so um the the short-term insurance you understand it's all got to do with cash flow um a, a very good question that a financial planner will ask um, very early in the initial stages is how is your cash flow do you have a budget and if you have a budget, do you actually stick to your budget? How disciplined are you? And it's not um, a, a, a kind of a, a question that, that he wants to embarrass you with. It's, it's all part of his actual, actual risk feel in, in if we get to the planning and the execution stage, what's the chances of you actually sticking to the plan? Because if somebody doesn't have a budget or a very good cash flow, then chances are that with the first draft of wind, the whole house of cars is going to come falling down because the exhaust of his car broke, and now he has to stop this and do this, and, and then it's, it's, it's just a lot of planning in vain. All right, so ensure that you've got a budget, that you know what is your disposable income, that you know what is available to address your financial risk needs. All right, if you've got very limited means in terms of paying someone else to take the risk because that's what insurance is isn't it the risk is not gone you're just paying someone else to carry that risk so that actually brings us to a, a logical consequence on the other side is so if i do not have the money to address that financial risk 
what can I do to prepare myself to actually carry it if that risk actually comes my way? Because there's horses running, away, running around. Eh? Remember what, what we read? What we read. So, um, <laughs> ask young clients. Um, uh, uh, this is a good question for a young client. So, what is your financial plan if you've been in this vehicle accident and you um, paralyzed from the waist down? What's your financial plan to become dependent on dad? Or ask Sunlum or Old Mutual or Momentum or Discovery or some of the companies to carry that risk and you pay them 300 Rand for 3 million Rand's worth of disability cover. What, what, the, 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 what's your plan? And then, um, because either one is valid. It's not a question of right or wrong. Uh, if, if, you know, my dad's very successful, we've got a trust and, and I'm a beneficiary of this trust and we've actually spoken about it. And my dad told me, listen, the trust will take care of us from a financial risk plan point of view. Then it's a tick that the financial planner actually, yeah, we've, we've discussed it. It's fine. But if there's not someone that'll, that can catch you, some people say, listen, government will have to catch me. Okay, fine. But then you know it's, it's, it's going to be kind of a, a it's, it's not such a sure horse in terms of catching and it will be very limited. All right, so, but if that's his plan, then you tick it, that's his plan. So if a good financial planner actually f slips into the role of, 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 of thinking with his client in terms of his way of looking at the world. All right, and, and guide him and, and confront him sometimes and remind him a lot there's a lot of reminding happening, actually, because people live their lives and the horse is running around and the seals are being broken. All right, so it's busy. Um, so you can see that from a risk perspective, in terms of death, disability, temporary disability, if you've been off for six, seven months, you've had some accident, and who's going to pay your overheads, your debtors? Are they, do you have a three, four months debtor? book that can carry you for four months and what after that that short-term cash flow that's part of the critical questions that a financial planner should ask and make a note of some clients will say no you know Lo, I've got a paid off property with an open bond so there's a facility and I call that the spare wheel so I, I tick it and so all part of the questions that you ask is and say how deep is your flexi faci facility on your bond uh, how big's your debtors book it all kind of flows in the discussions but Financial planner, make notes of that. All right. The very first step then is risk planning. It's scenario planning. From which direction is which horse coming into your world? And are, are, are you, do you have this plan that you can just sidestep, get out of the way, and, um, or just get a plan that just unfolds? All right. The second part of financial planning is um, the uh, wealth creation part. That's strategy and diversification and using legislation to your benefit. There's beautiful legislation, worldwide, global legislation, and in South Africa, actually, that can be harnessed to your benefit. And a good financial planner should know which legislation uh, to use and which legislation to plan according to, to, to kind of just step out of the way, that the ball can kind of just bounce through. All right, um, that's, that's part of planning. All right, um, um, uh, for you, in your mind, just check, am I well diversified? That's the biggest question. Well diversified means if all your wealth is in your primary residence. So hello, I've got a paid off house, that's the bulk of my wealth. You're not well diversified. You actually got a very, very high risk portfolio. One asset class, physical asset class. You can't control who's your neighbor. You can't control legislation. You can't control the, 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 the uh, when we're going into election time again. So there will be a lot of stuff that's just going to be thrown at the electors, uh, to, at, the, um, at our country. And, and it's going to create massive waves. You don't have control of that, but that will impact the value of your property and whether somebody will want to buy your property or not. Right, it, it, it all impacts that. So, there's so much that you can't control that makes it a high risk investment. So there's big value in contemplating, I know it's going to sound like heresy to some, but um, uh, renting. Is, is it so far-fetched to, in a high risk environment, 
highly charged political area um, where there's so much unsureness. Is it maybe worth renting and unlocking my capital and diversifying that to make me more, me more flexible and adaptable and liquid? All this flexible mobility, liquidity, um, it all speaks to adaptability. And, and you'll know, being adaptable, being an entrepreneur for your whole life, it's all about adaptability. Quick, adapt you need to be quick. And, and if you're not bogged down, um, and if you're well diverse and you're liquid, then you're actually well, well positioned for, for, for massive changes. All right. Something to discuss with your financial planner. Um, we grew up in an era where property was critical. It's, it's a big chunk. Um, I think that changed. Where, where, um, 22 years ago when I started as a financial planner, property investments was, uh, uh, were deemed a low-risk investment. I don't think it's anymore. In terms of financial planning, what we, we, we actually positioned it as moderate to moderate aggressive because of the fact that um, if, if one bad news comes, if one polit politician states one sentence, you sit, sit with an illiquid asset all of a sudden uh, or something that you'll have to basically... Um, half the price just to, to get out of it. All right. So be careful for, for, for not being diversified. All right. Um, I think um, I've made my point. Um, uh, I told Andre I can keep on and keep on um, uh, because I can, in each one of these critical bobs that I've um, thrown, um, I can just delve into. Uh, but I think I just wanted to stimulate uh, a discussion. How can, how can we get hold of you? Um, <laughs> um, I'll um, give you my num um, I can give you my number now if you want. Um, it's 082. And Andre's got my number as well. Yeah. My, my, my number is 082 854 9922. Yeah. Good. Yeah. A cover, um, business insurance, and we they selected the option of uh, debit with me for not recurring for two rand fifty a month, which was without showing. And six months later, uh, I mean, this was three rand fifty a month, and we covered them for business interruption probably for six months or yeah, six months. I think up to one point eight more. And six months later, COVID hit, and our insurance actually honoured that because they had selected that two rand fifty option per month, and they paid them out up to one point eight more. But as a financial planner, and you're talking about, I'm so glad you're coming from a theologian aspect, you know, from a scriptural, biblical perspective, is that as these horses run around and as different seals are opened, how do you navigate that? I mean, as a, as a Christian, I look at scripture that says, like, in the end times, gold and silver will be thrown out from the chute. And then I hear all these people saying, no, divest and invest in gold and silver. But, you know, how do you reconcile all of that into your aspect your job and into delivering advice. I mean, how do you go about that? Um, if you can just rephrase that yeah. um, in, in one short... So, so, how do you reconcile as a Christian giving that advice? For example, like th just another experience I had, like I, I lost a few clients during the COVID thing because people's liquidity shrunk straight away and they couldn't afford their, All right. their, their, their vehicle insurance, which was finance, which mm. legislatively you should have insurance on because it's not yours, it's the bank. Yeah. They can't pay the insurance because liquidity yeah. is gone. No, no, um, yeah, uh, it, it, it all depends on your client base, how resilient they are. Um, but, but COVID struck everyone. Um, um, I, f uh, I think broadly speaking, most of my clients, who's mostly entrepreneurs actually, uh, took a 40% knock, just yeah. like that. And, um, but um, I saw that in the financial crunch uh, 20, uh, 2008 as well. It took about four months for entrepreneurs. 
to find their feet to determine how deep is the water now and how strong should I wade and where to shall, shall I wade and where is the rocks that I can step in. And, and that's all about the adaptive mentality of entrepreneurs to, to uh, really wade through that. But um, now there's a dip. Um, I took a dip. Everybody took a dip. So you, you, as you know, you kind of dip with your clients. And where, uh, where clients are uh, unsure about what lies ahead, they tend to hold back yeah. their decisions, which is a wise thing to do, actually. So, uh, and as they wait, you wait with them. Um, yeah, it's a good time to take an extended leave. <laughs> business as well is to just communicate so if you've got a problem whatever that problem is whatever it is doesn't matter who it's with it doesn't matter whether it's the banks uh, where, where, wherever it is insurers life insurance if you communicate they can help a lot it, a lot of them can actually help yes. so i think communication is everything spot on business. spot on I think just a, just a quick question. Obviously, I work with a lot of the um, entrepreneurs and small businesses and stuff like that. And I always love having the discussion about time value of money. You know, to between this, how many grand a day, what does that mean? How many can we work in two years' time and stuff? And I think the risk that I see, or that I see with a lot of entrepreneurs, is that they so busy trying to hustle and bustle and all those type of things. And the thing that always takes the back seat is the life insurance and investing and preparing for retirement and stuff. You know, you find somebody that sitting and sticks you in the wind, that's got nothing in place, you know, so maybe if you want to just a quick discussion on time value of money, maybe just one or two examples that we can maybe remember. Yeah, yeah, time, time value of money is, got, is, is the effect that inflation has on your purchasing power. So um, I remember when I was um, in grade three, standard in, in Bloemfontein, um, I could, uh, for three cents, I could buy a clover, small orange juice, three cents. Okay, I don't know what it costs now. All right, so <laughs> not, not three cents. So, so in terms of your personal financial planning, um, uh, if, if I tell you you'll have 15 million rand in um, 14 years that you can retire off, now 15 million rand, just as a rule of thumb, is approximately 3 million rand in today's purchasing power. All right, 3, 3.5 mil. All right, and if that's invested, it gives you approximately 15,000 rand, 17,000 rand a month pension. So 15 million then gives you the lifestyle of 17,000 rand a month today. And that is what a financial planner should point out. Inflation is our enemy. And that is why our government, the way they target inflation is spot on. Absolute spot on. Um, um, that band of three to six percent that they're targeting, um, and say so we can't do this because of inflation. We can't do that because of inflation. Um, if 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 in inflation is going to become rampant, then it's just a free for all, and everybody's just throwing and printing money. Um, then it's just going to erode your retirement um, purchasing power in a massive way. So we need to check that part of legislation and the way legislation is actually implemented in our government. It gives you a very good idea what's lying ahead in terms of what you will be able to do with your money. Something that is, uh, everyone talks about Bitcoin. So I mean, that, that kind of approaches that. Are you into that? You I don't get it as well, so I'm, I mean, I'm glad we agree on that. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 so yeah. Yeah. And um, the underlying technology is, is incredibly useful, so I understand. I'm not a techno junkie, but I understand the blockchain technology is, is yeah. incredibly valuable in terms of uh, storage and security of data, which which I understand. And it um, uh, there's this this deep skepticism globally about government. And, and this type of technology and this type of currency gives people the, 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 the feel that they can start to, to have a life without government interference. Now, with, in that, there's massive risks as well, not only opportunities. Um, so governments are very much starting to focus on legislating cryptos. 
Um, and as legislation is going to tighten its screws, we'll see actually where this is heading. It's absolutely speculative at this stage because it's not regulated. It's a free flow. It's like the tulips of Amsterdam. A black tulip for $1,000 and a red one for five. Um, it's, uh, it's, that's the way I see it. Yeah. But some people are making a lot of money on, th on this speculative um, bubbles and dips and... Uh, It's, it's, it's a high risk. Yeah, I, I, I don't advise on those. Yeah. So you would keep up with your eye with those based on your own yeah, big losses. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe just to ask a question from my own personal side. Um, uh, you know, you haven't read the book yet and I think it's fundamental to anybody to understand it and especially young people you know Robert Kiyosaki is a big that word and if you haven't read it I think most of us would have read it but in that book he says the following thing he says that he is he's not a legal expert or he's not a he's, he's not an accountant he's he, he he's not all these lots of other things that that specifically entrepreneur that needs to be. Um, but what he does, he selects around him a professional team, which would typically be the best lawyer, the best tax advice, you know, advice person, <laughs> the best financial planner, um, and, 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 and so it goes, so that you ultimately ultimately build a relationship with those people um, so often um, there they are these policy salesmen you know that just want to make a quick sale here and a, you know sell a short-term insurance or a life you know insurance policy here and there and they, 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 they are there um, but they are definitely um, not there for the long run they just want to make a sale and then they go on to the next person that they want to make a sale. So my question is, practically, how would one go about in finding that guy, the best lawyer or the best accountant or the best financial planner? Uh, now specifically now in this instance from a financial planning point of view, how, how do you find that guy? Okay. Because I think there, there's a lot of, you know, other people might also have financial planning, you know, but. But I think it's, it's important that one find that right guy that's going to stick with you when there's a 40% dip in the market. And he's going to say to you, you know, we, we, we'll make a plan. We'll just restructure this or that or whatever. Yeah. Firstly, I'll um, want to ensure that your financial advisor um, has got the academical acumen. And it's all because it's about legislation. That's all. It's, he, needs, he needs to understand legislation and, and there's uh, continuous professional development that he needs to adhere to to keep his CFP designation. So it means he needs to keep abreast. First thing, ensure that he knows the legal environment, all right? Secondly, you, you'll find out very quickly in the very first meeting, what type of questions is he asking? That, that will actually um, show his heart as well, won't it? If, 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 he, if he's asking you good diagnostic analytical questions about your personal financial life and your ambitions and your direction where you're heading and, and wanting to fall in behind you and want to enable your dreams and your visions and your hopes, we, we, we're in tune emotionally. All of us got emotional intelligence to quickly determine whose interests are being served here and it's all in the questions it's all in the questions so I think that make sure he's academically qualified to give advice remember policies are not difficult really it's 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 easy um, it's this plaster for this cut yeah. but it's what how deep is the cut um, shouldn't should we get stitches or what medication should we add here before we do this the, the plaster right, that is more the the, the medical specialist that di doctor that needs to diagnose as well does it make sense yeah. yeah how do you determine knowledge 
and in his questions, who's, um, who's, he, working who's he working for? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what area do you cover? Do you, would, you, would you see everybody in any area? Absolutely. Um, uh, before COVID, that's one of the wonderful things that COVID actually in, uh, introduced in, in our life. Um, it's just so much easier. People who are kind of reluctant to meet on, on Teams or Zoom or WhatsApp video calls, it's now so easy to have this first meeting actually via technology because it's all about data. Um, um, let, let, let's just feel whether this is a compatible business relationship, all right? Tell me your story. Let me ask my questions. Um, all right, and then we establish, and then um, I think it will be worthwhile um, setting up a physical meeting after that initial um, meeting, and, and all the data has been established, all the information has been gathered. Um, I think a financial planner will want to step into someone else's life actually three-dimensional life um and 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 and, and feel and see because actually that's where the joy for the financial plan for me lies it's 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 not only in the, in the in the analytical stuff it's actually stepping into someone else's home and and see what's against their walls and 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 and, and asking about that it, it, it makes it incredibly personal um and um, satisfying Yeah, 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 that's a fair question. Yeah, I think th that is part of the, part of the big um, uh, uh, decision that's actually made in the very, very first meeting. Um, the financial planner needs to determine how he is going to be paid. And it actually comes out of the discussion. Um, if a client tells me, listen, Lo, my trust is in a total mayhem. I'm not sure what my trust admin is like. And I'm not even sure whether my will talks to my trust. Um, uh, but, I, but I'm uninsurable. Uh, because of a heart attack I had five years ago, so uh, the insurance need to stay just as it is. We've got, we've got that. Can you help me with this? Yeah, I can, but then I'll charge you a fee, and and the fee for that varies in terms of the complexity, and um, uh, the the time time spent will will impact that, and that is where it can become expensive. Actually, it's an hour rate. That's an hourly rate for that, and and financial planners are paid in that instance for, for a lot of very, very various tasks but where there's financial products that forms part of the solution there's a commission structure embedded in those products um, and um, uh, you'll know intuitively one do the calculations you know what type of premiums or that you just feel it and you say okay then I'll, I'll be fairly compensated over time um, I'm, I'm we, we can just proceed and um, I'll be paid from the financial products. Think of a doctor and a pharmacy. Doctor paid by, um, by the hour rate, pharmacy by providing the solution for the illness. So a financial planner kind of stands on both legs. He, he, he sees where, where or both um, can be used to remunerate me for my time and knowledge. And um, back off, uh, the salaries are hectic in the background. So it, it costs money. traditional investment vehicles that you have, like uh, investing in a retirement plan that's uh, pegged on blue chip companies or high, high risk, low risk, moderate risk. You know, we, we kind of uh, limited or boxed into the specific vehicle through legislation as well, through certain uh, investments that people can put their money into. Is there an alternative investment structural community or market that we can, I know I'm asking a huge, huge out there question, mm. Is there an alternative uh, environment that people can look at? 
Firstly, in terms of the market crash of 2008, um, um, uh, values almost half within um, a week or two, all right? Um, and it rebounded um, about three, four months later. Don't cash in when you're at the bottom. Don't panic. The horses come and go. All right. Um, just go through the dip. This massive, if, if you look at the long-term history of the Janusburg Stock Exchange, it's like this. But if you look at the trajectory, if you just stayed in, you would have been fine. Just don't panic. Don't sell out. All right. Because remember, all those companies that, that's, in, that's um, listed, they, they still make profits. It's just that people are kind of stepping away and, and, and just wanting to check, and that affects the value. It, it just dips. And then when clarity comes and the entrepreneurs made their um, calculations and the consumer said, okay, so it's not Armageddon, um, uh, we can proceed again, then you know, it just um, comes along again. We see that in COVID. It's a f four or five months later, and, you, and it just ran the market. Now with Putin and these tricks, um, it's like wobbly all over again. That too shall pass. All right, just stay invested. Um, uh, Warren Buffett said, uh, never waste a good crisis. Yeah. All right, it, it creates a dip. It's a, it's, it's a good buying opportunity. And he also said, uh, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Uh, we spoke about it yesterday. Um, uh, it's, it's just having the, just look through everything. It's, there's a, there's a timeline. All right. Um, Alternative assets, um, uh, it speaks to my, my one comment on wealth creation, be well diversified. Um, the same circumstances will impact one asset class negatively and another one positively. All right, so uh, that's a, 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 a uncorrelated assets. Some uh, discussion um, we had yesterday as well. Um, it's, it's incredibly important to have uncorrelated assets. The same circumstances affects each asset differently. Does that make sense? Any more questions? I just want to make a closing comment. The thing is, uh, I think on just adding on to what your, your comment was, and and, and I, wa I want to challenge you. Go and, go and Google city largest um, stock price. Now, what you'll see is um, at the, when, when, when COVID hit, it's absolutely rock bottom to almost nothing. In such, to, to such an extent that the, the market capitalization of the company was actually um, or, or or the share price far outweighed the market capitalization of the mm -hmm. company. So, so what what we actually meant was that the, that the, if you had a share or the, the shares in the in the company was valued less than what the what the assets were worth. Yeah, the buildings were worth. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So then someone said, "But listen, this COVID thing. Yes, okay, fine. There's nobody staying in the in the hotel at the moment, but." Does this COVID virus affect the physical building? Right. So, um, and it, it didn't. It's not that the building broke down or anything. It was it was still there. So what it in effect means is that when COVID is gone and uh, you know uh, the world opens up again, people are going to start traveling again. We've seen this. And. Um, People are going to go on holiday and on business. But then they need to go back to that hotel that's still standing there, that's still <laughs> owned by City Life. But the thing is, if you were now like Warren Buffett said, is the value of the asset is still good. Now, before COVID, the, as the, the, the share price was, let's say for argument, at 100 rand. And in a matter of a couple of days, it fell to 1 rand. So you can actually buy city lots below what it's actually worth and then just wait. <laughs> now, the crux of the matter is you and I, 
that are not financial planners or professional investors. We go and say, sell when it's low and buy when it's high. So that's it. The one guy said to him, listen, you forget about the highs and the lows. I will worry about that. Let me do my job. You do your job. And I think this is where financial planning comes in. You need to build a relationship with a person and let them worry about what they need to worry about. But you need to be in a relationship with them that you know that, listen, they're going to cover your back when you need to be covered. Yeah. Steve, can I ask you to close for us? Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. We love the folklore, Dad. <laughs>